Elden Ring was released earlier this year to great critical and commercial success. As someone who has been playing the Soulsborne games for years, I was happy to see so many new people interact with this style of game. To celebrate that, I wanted to make a video series about how we got to Elden Ring, what lessons were learned along the way, who is the mastermind behind it all, and what the future looks like post Elden Ring. This is the third video in the series. If you enjoy the video, please remember to like and subscribe so you'll know when the next one is released. Previously, we spoke about From Software's run-up to Demon's Souls, how they kept trying this RPG idea they had but struggled to find meaningful success until Demon's Souls, and what was different from their previous attempts. But when people refer to a Souls-like or another game similar to From Software's formula, they're often referring to Dark Souls. So what was it that pushed Dark Souls to even greater success than Demon's Souls? First, the obvious out of the way. Demon's Souls was published by Sony and was, therefore, a platform exclusive to the PlayStation 3. And while the PlayStation 3 was a popular console, Sony had not quite seen the same runaway success they did in previous generations or in generations to come. Simply put, fewer people had access to Demon's Souls. Whereas Dark Souls was published by Namco Bandai and released across multiple platforms. Now, this inherently means that Dark Souls could reach more people, but to attribute From Software's success and the success of this beloved franchise purely to more people having access is doing them a disservice. So what was it? What changed between Demon Souls and Dark Souls that catapulted the series? If you are one of the many people who fell in love with the Souls series but never played Demon Souls, be it before your time or you simply didn't have a PlayStation, this may surprise you, but Demon Souls was not an open world game. Don't get me wrong, Dark Souls isn't an open world game either, but it has an open structure. Whereas in Demon Souls you had a hub called the Nexus where you picked the level you had access to, loaded into said level, played it all the way through, fought the boss at the end, unlocking sub-levels, then loaded back into the Nexus, where after a bit of chit-chat, you would load into that sub-level or new level entirely. And if you're annoyed at the number of times I've said load, it's because I mean load, as in hard loading screen load. You could select a level you completed previously, but there wasn't much else to do except farm some additional souls. And more often than not, once you completed a level, you were done. Dark Souls greatly improved on this formula. It isn't an open world game. There is still a set path that you follow. There is no invisible wall stopping you from exploring other trails, but you'll quickly find out if you're on a course you're not ready for. While following this path, you'll find branching ways to explore. After completing a tough section or boss, you'll often find a way to open a shortcut that will lead you back to safety. When you're ready to set off again, you can use that shortcut to get further, quicker and safer. All of this without encountering a loading screen. This plays into the game's immersion. The world feels large and oppressive, the danger is around every corner, and you don't get a chance to catch your breath. Without a loading screen constantly pulling you out of the game, the game feels like a tremendous, dangerous world that you're exploring and conquering. The lack of level structure also led to one of Dark Souls' most recognizable innovations. If you haven't played Demon's Souls but weren't surprised at the level structure, perhaps this will surprise you. Demon's Souls did not have bonfires, an addition that has become a staple to From Software's RPGs and Souls-like all around. Bonfires added a bit of strategy in resource management and a bit of risk-reward decision-making. Because Dark Souls didn't have levels in the same way, it meant that you weren't constantly returning to the Nexus to upgrade your character, buy items, etc. To get around that, Dark Souls introduced bonfires, mostly safe areas where you could stumble upon during the travels, where you could level up, manage a bit of inventory, and importantly, refill your Estus Flask, your healing item. The catch is that it would respawn all the enemies you have killed. In Demon's Souls, you recovered health using Moongrass, a consumable you could purchase in the Nexus. There wasn't a limit in the same way Estus Flasks are limited, so you could stockpile a decent amount. And it meant that the majority of fights you took in Demon's Souls, you would start at full health, and taking damage wasn't as punishing. Now, I'm not saying Demon's Souls was easy. We all know what it's like to reach the boss only to realize you only have one clump of Moongrass left. This changed in Dark Souls though. With Estus Flasks, there was a limit on how many times you could heal between bonfires. This added a bit of strategy when to use Estus Flasks. Do you start the next fight at 80% health, not wanting to use a full Estus charge for 20%? Once you've run out, do you continue not knowing how long it'll be before you see another bonfire? Or do you turn around and respawn the same enemies that cost you all those charges? But it played into the game's brutal demands on the player. Congratulations on completing that troublesome section. You've reached the boss door but your health is low, and you don't have any more charges. So again, congratulations for making it this far, but go back, do it again, and do it better.
The addition of bonfires and the little strategy and risk that it introduced propelled the series forward, along with the best change to the Dark Souls game, the open world structure. But these two things alone are not why Dark Souls became as popular as it did, and instead it allowed what made it so popular to take place. These games are hard. They just are. Compared the difficulty to most games available, especially back in 2011, these games just unapologetically kicked your ass in a way most games didn't. We've spoken in other videos about how that difficulty developed, and why the creative designer Hirotaka Miyazaki wanted it that way. But knowing that doesn't make them any easier. With the open nature of Dark Souls, there was so much more to learn and discover. Different strategies, different builds, different paths. There was so much in a game so hard that to ask an isolated individual to see and do it all is nearly impossible. So communities started to develop online. People sharing tactics, secrets and character builds, all with a shared goal of not just beating the game, but beating everything the game had to offer. To conquer the challenge. Every obscure quest, every secret boss, open every shortcut. I don't pre-order games and I don't like buying a game on release, just too many games released in a broken state. Souls games, for better or worse, are the exception. Watching those communities learn as we all make a group effort at beating Miyazaki's latest gauntlet is some of the most rewarding experiences I've had in games. Watching an entire website or forum go, wait, you can skip Blight Town? is amazing, and something that's not common in other gaming communities. Dark Souls' high demands and deep depths allow these communities to thrive, and this group play is what propelled Dark Souls beyond its predecessor, and what carried the Souls franchise to the heights of today. Don't get me wrong, other games have had communities built around them before, of course, and the Souls community is by no means perfect. Gatekeeping can be an annoyance, and as a franchise known for its difficulty definitely produces some inflated egos. But those are few and far between, and to have a community built around not just a game but a challenge, a grueling dozens of hours challenge requiring pre-planning, concentration and patience through trial and error. Many, many errors. The closest analogy I have in gaming is raiding. If you've ever raided in WoW, Final Fantasy XIV or Destiny or any online game, if you've ever played a game where a large group of people comes together to try and beat something the developers have thrown at you, that's the closest it comes to playing a Souls game on release. Just longer and you don't have to wait for everyone to log on. If Dark Souls was not as hard as it is and didn't have the depth of exploration and different combat bulls and paths, these communities wouldn't have grown. And if Dark Souls did have the same high demands and strategic depths but communities didn't grow around it, I don't think Souls games would be as popular. Without the occasional helping hand of other players, I believe the overwhelming majority of fans would have stopped long ago, myself included. For the story to turn into the success it had, you needed both. You needed a game that gave purpose and motivation to these communities. You needed people willing to come together and help each other bang their heads against every fake wall to make up these communities. This is what sets Dark Souls apart. This put Dark Souls and From Software on the track towards Elden Ring. These communities would continue to grow and head into the challenges offered as the franchise continued. From Software would release two more games in the franchise, as well as Bloodborne and Sekiro, continuing to fine tune their formula. The combat in these games is very iconic, and at the time, very unique. Even the control scheme was uncommon, having the attacks on shoulder buttons instead of the face buttons. Many games have emulated this combat style, becoming a cornerstone of the genre. But what makes this combat so iconic is the deliberate rhythm behind it. There is a rhythm behind the action of these games that demands patience. Like a dance, trying to fight against the rhythm only leads to bloody toes. You can't rush it. You'll almost certainly be punished. And as From Software continued working on this rhythmic combat style, they've added different flavors. You have Bloodborne with its more aggressive, friendly approach. You still can't mindlessly rush in, but if you were reactive and prepared enough, you could get away with playing aggressively without getting punished. Still playing with this rhythmic combat, but at a faster pace. From Software added these flavors to offer players more choices in their combat, and get them out from behind their shields. While Dark Souls has variations on this combat, be it a heavy roll strength build, or a light dex build, or even a magical faith mage build, the combat rhythm was very similar. From Software wanted to provide a change of rhythm, they did this again with Sekiro, providing a fast, reaction-heavy version of the deliberate combat, with the different dodges and parry system, forcing you to pick up the pace, not using a shield, but still being patient and deft enough to parry or use a specific dodge. If you're listening to the evolution of this combat and your impression is, this sounds hard, well, you're not alone.
As someone who has had the horrible sinking feeling of realizing you've just lost a large number of souls to a dumb mistake fueled by impatience, or feeling like I got cheated on death, seriously now I need to be weary of treasure chests, my next feeling usually is, man, I want my friends to feel just as bad as I do. But as many in the Souls community knows, you can't force a Souls game on someone. The game has such high demands that if you're not motivated to try and meet these demands, you're not going to have a good time. And that difficulty has been called into question regularly over the years. It feels like there are two sides of this argument. One, that From Software's games should have a difficulty setting so that those that want to turn it down can, and those that feel that if the difficulty is turned down, then the soul of these games, that rewarding feeling of achievement, is lost. This is a hard one. On the one hand, I want as many people to experience the games I like, not only because I want them to keep making those games and more players as incentive to do so, but also because some of these games are the best experiences I've had in any entertainment medium. That's awesome. And more people should experience that. So, normally in games, more choice for the player is better. Let someone play their way. From Software themselves believe this, as they've made more and more combat styles viable over the years. But did you catch the key word? Normally. When it comes to the difficulty of these games, I don't think they should be made easier. The difficulty really is the soul of these games. It's the challenge that fuels players' desires to play the game. It's the motivation that created the online communities. While I want as many people to experience it, I don't think you would be experiencing the game without its soul. For many years and many iterations of the From Software formula, this felt like an impossible problem to solve, and one that could never have an answer. And then? Well, we reached that point in the series. Next time we'll be talking about Elden Ring, how the lessons from previous titles influence Elden Ring, the ups and downs the game brings, and what the future looks like after Elden Ring. If you've made it to the end, thank you very much for sticking with me this far. This is the longest video I've produced yet, and I appreciate your time. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you'll know when the next one is released. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.